This episode is the first in a series of review of the Panasonic GH4. I get a lot of questions over time about which camera should I buy. I can't tell you which camera you should buy, but let's talk about the GH4 and see if it's a good fit for you. Check this out. Got my hands on the Panasonic GH4 a couple days ago, actually four or five days ago, five days ago. Been working with it quite a bit since then, every day, and still getting to know the camera quite a bit. This is my first uh, mirrorless camera, and I bought it primarily for video. Um, I, I still will keep my Nikon D600 mainly for still shooting um, and as a second camera for video, but um, this is probably going to become my new primary video camera. So. I can't really do a full review right now, but I'd like to do it in installments and talk about some of the things I've uh, learned so far that I'm finding really, really nice about this camera and some of its limitations. So let's look in. All right, first of all, obviously the price, I think most of you know, if you've looked into this camera is $1,700 US. I think for that price, it's a really good video camera. And I think it's a decent still camera for that price. Now, I think on the still side, you could probably do better for that same amount of money if that's gonna be your primary purpose. But if you're looking for something mainly for video, I think that's really, um, it's a really, it's a sweet spot, really. You're getting a lot for $1,700. Now, first of all, the build quality is quite nice on this camera. So um, a lot of interchangeable lens mirrorless cameras don't necessarily have the, the best build quality. Actually, well, I take that back. A lot of them are getting better build quality. In fact, some of them have better build quality than a lot of the lower end DSLRs. But this one seems pretty top notch. It's not, uh, it's not exactly, you know, like your, from a, from a stills perspective, it's not like your Nikon D4 or your Canon uh, 1D, but it is pretty good uh, build quality. There is a magnesium alloy body, so it does feel pretty tough and like it stand up pretty well over time. One of the main things I like about this camera is the size and the weight is very small, very light, relative to a lot of the other DSLRs I've been shooting in the past. And it has a really nice maturing uh, set of lenses you can choose from, and you can adapt other lenses as well. So in my case, for example, I've got all this beautiful Nikon glass. I can get an adapter and put it on this camera. At this point, the thing that interested me the very most about this camera was not so much the 4K. Surprisingly, a lot of people get really excited about the 4K, and I think that's great. I think it really kind of makes the camera somewhat future-proof. Um, but and there are a lot of things you can do with 4K. You can capture in 4K, then crop and or um, you know downsample to 1080p, and gives you a lot of flexibility. However, for me, the thing that really intrigued me about this camera, in addition to 4K, I should say, is that out of the HDMI port, it outputs 422 color in 10 bit. I don't think that's that's pretty unprecedented on cameras in this price range, with one or two exceptions. I think the two exceptions really are the Blackmagic Cinema Camera and the Blackmagic. Um, pocket cinema camera so you can get those kind of signals out of those two but those are kind of in a those are different cameras for, for a variety of reasons we'll talk about in just a minute so the that additional color output from the HDMI is really interesting to me because I I like to shoot into a recorder that can capture all that information in the camera itself it'll record 4208 bit whether you're shooting 4k whether you're shooting 1080. Um, but going out that HDMI port, you get that extra color information and that extra bit depth. And that, you know, arguably a lot of people say, well, I can't see any difference. And, and I think I agree with that. For the most part, you can't see a difference. But when you're doing color correction, especially uh, secondary corrections and grading, that's when you start to see a difference with a 10-bit signal. So that's what's really kind of most um, interesting to me. One, I think, very valid question is why not just get a Blackmagic camera? And I think that Blackmagic is doing some amazing things in our world right now. And I'm really happy with the direction they're headed. I love DaVinci Resolve. I'm, I'm really impressed with the things they're doing with their cameras. But to be honest, those cameras have a lot of first generation issues. Battery life is notoriously bad on the first generation of those cameras. And that's really kind of a practical annoyance. Um, the sensors are pretty small. Now that's something you can work around with using things like Metabone speed boosters. Um, to adapt other lenses and that that I think you can work around that but they don't tend to do very well in low light either and not that the GH4 is a fantastic low light camera but I think it's probably doing better than most of those black magic cameras are doing now straight out of the camera with the default settings you get really nice crisp image and a very contrasty great looking image if you're doing certain types of shooting 
but is not great if you're doing other types of shooting. So the great thing about the GH4 is that it gives you plenty of flexibility to fine tune the image for the type of shooting that you're doing. So again, like I said, straight out of the camera default settings, it's so contrasty and sharp. And that's really great if you're doing some sort of like nature shooting, um, something where you want to really kind of crisp, almost uh, in some ways, if like if you're shooting people, it'll be a little bit of a gritty look. It'll show every single detail of their face. <laughs> Um, so that could be the look you're going for, but sometimes when you're doing talking head and interview style like I'm doing, I don't really want it to be that sharp. So at first I was really kind of stunned and a little shocked. It was like, whoa, way too much information. It's just a great design camera so it can really capture all that information if you need it. But if you don't want it to be quite so sharp and quite so crisp, you can dial that back as well. Now, so far in my testing, and again, it's only been four days, but I've shot with other DSLRs. I've shot with Canon 60D pretty extensively, with a Nikon D600 pretty extensively. I've shot with a Canon 7D, um, and there have been others as well. But those are my the main cameras I've shot with, and I can say confidently after four days shooting with this that I really like this one for video better than any of those others. I haven't shot with a 5D Mark III, and especially in RAW mode, and that may be a, that's kind of a special camera as well. I think a lot of people are really enjoying that. And I'm not saying that this is better than that, but I'm really enjoying it so far. One other issue I was looking to solve as a DSLR video shooter was moiré issues. Now, I think that the only DSLRs that I can think of that have really kind of addressed moiré issues are, first of all, the Canon 5D Mark III. And secondly, I don't know if they really intended this, but the Nikon D5200 and 5300 tend to do pretty well in terms of suppressing uh, moiré issues as well. In this case, we're recording at 1080p uh, out of HDMI port into the Atomos Ninja 2. Now, this is a test here to see how the moiré is on this camera. Now, this will be the same, to be honest, uh, when I tested it recording in camera versus the Atomos. It is doing what appears to be line skipping on the sensor. So to get that 1080p image, it's using the entire sensor sized, but it's reading every maybe third or fourth line, whatever the, the math works out to be. So it's skipping lines, which makes it more susceptible to moiré. And when I move around with my shirt, this shirt is um, notoriously bad for, for pro providing those uh, patterns that are really hard for cameras to capture without moiré. So this is what that looks like. Okay, and here's another example with the extended tele on, or EX tele, as it's uh, shown in the menu. Now the difference here is that rather than using the entire surface of the sensor, it's actually cropping down to just a, the center portion of the sensor. And what that uh, provides as a benefit is that it doesn't do line skipping. It's actually reading every single row. And so we're seeing a lot less moiré in my earlier tests. And let's see how this one turns out here. So again, we've got the, the moiré shirt and uh, moving around should produce less moiré. Now, it's important to note that in the 4K mode, we don't see this moiré because again, it's not doing any line skipping. The other thing I love about the GH4 is its electronic viewfinder. Coming from a DSLR world, as soon as you go into video mode on a DSLR, the viewfinder's off limits. It doesn't work anymore because the mirror flips up out of the way in front of the sensor and it blocks the viewfinder. So you don't even have that as an option. On the um, GH4, it has an electronic viewfinder and it is wonderful to use that. It's so refreshing. And some of you that are already shooting cameras like this or, or you know, traditional video cameras, you already have that, but it's a really a big deal for anyone coming from a DSLR. There's another option there that makes it a lot easier to use outdoors, for example, if you don't have a, you know, some sort of hood or loop to put over the screen on your camera. And as far as electronic viewfinders go, I've used some previous generation viewfinders that were eh, not so great. The viewfinder, the electronic viewfinder on the GH4 is fantastic. They've really, really done a nice job. Very little lag, pretty good color, um, and enough detail to really work with it. One main thing I don't love about the camera, well, two main things, I guess. The 1080p, lots of more A issues, but again, there are ways to work around that. Second thing is it's not the best low light camera I've ever used. And that's just because of the sensor size for the most part. I think Panasonic has done a good job. I think it is a good camera in terms of low light. It's not a great camera in terms of low light. So far, those are my impressions. Stick around if you'd like to learn more and also give us your input. If there are any things here that I've said that kind of uh, you have questions about, let us know and we may be able to put those in some of the future episodes. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure you go ahead and do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting, sound, and video. Talk with you soon.